So in this presentation, I'm going to look briefly at the common pathologies of the shoulder and then ask the question of how do we um, examine the shoulder in that context and the specialist test to, to look for those pathologies. And part of the problem is that it's, it's a difficult diagnosis from a test to, to make and we need an integrated clinical approach. And then I'm going to just go through some example clinical cases at the end. So the study was conducted as to what were the top four commonest causes of shoulder pain in general practice using um, ultrasound uh, diagnosis. And the top four were rotated cuff disease, uh, glenohumeral disease, acromoclavicular joint disease, uh, and then referred neck pain. And then you can further divide these into different components of rotated cuff disease, whether that be inflammation of the tendon or a complete um, tendon tear, or calcification of the supraspinatus tendon that was causing pain, or the subacromal bursitis. When looking at the glenohumeral disease, uh, you can look at arthritic disease, whether that's osteo or rheumatoid arthritis or capsular disease where they can develop adhesive capsulitis or what otherwise known as frozen shoulder, which is really a contracture of the capsule itself. The acromoclavicular joint disorders um, include osteoarthritis and dislocation of this joint. It's very common to get um, cervical disc disease presenting a shoulder pain um, and so it's worth asking about um, neck pain uh, and other neurological features. Other disease process can present as um, shoulder pain too, uh, particularly referred pain. Um, be careful that you not, don't miss an important disease like myocardial infarction. Uh, ask about any of the associated symptoms whether that be chest pain, sweating, um, the timing of the pain is it on exertion. We mentioned about cervical disc and root pain. Um, and every examination of the shoulder should really include an examination of the cervical spine. One of the golden rules of any joint examination is to examine the joint above and the joint below, particularly because of referred pain. Don't forget also irritation of the phrenic nerve can cause shoulder tip pain. So gallbladder disease or subphrenic abscesses can present a shoulder tip pain. So also worth asking about abdominal pain or fever if that's suspected. I had a colleague who sadly missed a lung cancer, a delayed diagnosis because the patient presented with shoulder pain and they focused on that. Um, they did do an x-ray but it didn't cover um, enough coverage of the lungs and they missed a, an apical lung cancer. So if someone has got a strong smoking history over the age of 45 um, and have any other symptoms or you suspect a possible cancer, then it's worth arranging a, a chest x-ray too. Now there's a danger that we um, can oversimplify the, the movements of the rotated cuff uh, and not really understand the complexity of the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is a multi-axle, that means it moves in all planes, a ball and socket um, joint, the humerus and the, the glenoid, and a synovial joint too, so it, it's, in, it's got a capsule uh, with fluid inside, and so it's a very complicated joint. It's got a far range, far reaching range of movement. If you think about all the daily activities you involved in and how you use your shoulder from the moment you get up to get dressed, um, comb your hair, um, reaching for things in the cupboard. All these activities involve um, quite complicated um, mechanical use of your shoulder. And so if you have a problem with your shoulder, immediately you have a lot of difficulties in your daily tasks. 
The shoulder joint is less stable than the hip joint as the socket is quite shallow. The glenoid does not go fully round the humerus, which allows it to be more free and, and to have a greater range of movement. But because of that, um, it's more prone to dislocation. The scapula, uh, the, the posterior part of the, the shoulder joint, is highly mobile and it can glide in and out, tilt upwards and downwards and around the thorax, allowing you to change the position and orientation of the socket. Which means if there's any shoulder weakness due to a tendon tear or a nerve palsy, the scapula can compensate uh, and thus you get these really abnormal scapular movements um, just to allow you, the, the person to, to do the movement they need to do. And part of the examination of a shoulder is looking behind and watching the scapula move back and forth, looking for any abnormal movements, give you a hint, a clue, as to maybe a nerve palsy, like a thoracic long nerve palsy, or a problem of a, a tear of maybe the rotated cuff. As we briefly mentioned, each movement of the shoulder, um, there are several groups of muscles that are activated to, to make that movement possible. And because of that, it's quite hard to isolate one muscle and its tendon to examine, to see if it, it's that problem, um, that, that muscle. For example, in arm abduction, the first 15 degrees of arm abduction is achieved by the supraspinatus muscle. That continues to be activated, but then abduction continues with the deltoid muscle, which is a big, powerful muscle, a big, powerful abductor of the shoulder. Um, and so if there is a supraspinatus problem, often the deltoid just kicks in uh, and, and does the majority of the abduction to compensate. Um, and finally, the last part of the abduction, right up, moving the arm next to the, the head, is the trapezius and serratus anterior muscles that are activated. And so when, for example, looking at um, examining the supraspinatus muscle, it's, it's possibly best just to keep that 15 degrees or, or, or less abducted um, so that you, you're not um, examining the deltoid, for example, when you're checking for resistance testing um, and any weakness. I wanted to put this slide up just to show you the range of movements of the scapula. You've got the downward and upward rotation, looking from behind. From above, you can see the anterior and posterior tipping of the scapula, and then a diagonal view of internal and external rotation. And this just shows you the extreme movements of the scapula that allows the, the body to move the glenial humeral joint to the starting position that the body wants it to start in. And it also shows you the compensation of the scapula if there's a problem in the shoulder. You know, the, the scapula is used in an excessive, excessive way by the body if there is a problem in the shoulder to compensate. Um, and this also adds complexity to the examination. But the problem of testing the rotator cuff is choosing so when thinking about the specialist tests, we have take, for example, near sign that we were looking at earlier. So again, look at Hawkins Kennedy tests. So just to reemphasize when looking at a shoulder. So what I've done in this slide is I've looked at as part of the clinical picture. We also it's important to think about the age of so I want to finish off with two different case scenarios, just to bring everything together. So clinical history is suggestive of a rotator cuff impingement. Take case two. A 41-year-old accountant is a keen... So the history is suggestive of a rotator cuff injury again um, with nocturnal pain.